Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. 1948 was a fascinating year in science fiction cinema, made during a time of significant political, economic, and cultural challenges. This was a time of rebuilding for some in Western Europe, and the Soviet Union continued its communist takeovers throughout Eastern Europe, including Czechoslovakia. But this was an exciting time for science. A monkey named Albert rocketed into the outskirts of space, making it 39 miles above the Earth, though he died during the flight. This was one step closer to sending humans into space. Operation Paperclip brought German scientists to the United States beginning in 1945 and were already at work. The Soviets were also in the game, launching their R-1 rocket in October. Most of the groundbreaking sci-fi cinema emerged from outside the United States, with films from Mexico, Germany, Finland, and Czechoslovakia. But that didn't stop Hollywood from producing the first live-action Superman serial and the second sci-fi film ever to be made in color. And then there was the debut of everyone's favorite Martian. Marvin was introduced in Looney Tunes' Hair Devil Hair animated short. Though his voice, name, and appearance would change slightly over the years, the showdown between Marvin the Martian and Bugs Bunny showed that even in 1948, Hollywood was already thinking about going to the moon, even if it was for comedic purposes. One quick side note before we dive in. I'll be doing my best to pronounce the German, Mexican, Czech, and Finnish names throughout this video. So apologies in advance if I don't nail every pronunciation perfectly. Hollywood wanted to adapt the Superman comic as early as 1940. Republic tried to get the rights, and when they failed, they produced the mysterious Dr. Satan instead. There was a radio show, and most notably, the Fleischer cartoons from 1941 to 1943. But this year, The Man of Steel finally made his live-action debut in the 15-chapter serial from Columbia Pictures. Helmed by the king of serial directors, Spencer Gordon Bennett, who directed titles I've discussed in the past, including The Purple Monster Strikes and Brick Bradford. Bennett was joined by his frequent collaborator, Thomas Carr, who would later direct episodes of The Adventures of Superman TV series. Kirk Allen, a 38-year-old former vaudeville performer and World War II veteran, debuted as Clark Kent and Superman. Allen was a regular working actor at the time, Producer Sam Katzman saw his photos and wanted to cast him, but National Comics initially refused. He later reprised his role in Adam Man vs. Superman in 1950, but turned down the opportunity to play Superman in the Adventures of Superman TV series, a role that eventually went to George Reeves. Noelle Neal, a pinup girl and model, portrayed Lois Lane, a role she would later reprise in future adaptations including Adam Man vs. Superman and The Adventures of Superman TV series. The cast also included Tommy Bond as Jimmy Olsen and Pierre Watkin as Perry White. Carol Foreman played the villainous Spider Lady. We last saw her in The Black Widow in 1947. Columbia spread the story that Superman was portraying himself in the serial. According to the book, the great movie serials, Their Sound and Fury, quote, Columbia's advertising claimed that it would not get an actor to fill the role, so it had hired Superman himself, and Kirk Allen was merely playing Clark Kent. The story, adapted from the comic book created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, follows Superman as he battles the Spider Lady, who seeks to control a dangerous weapon known as the Relativity Reducer Ray. The serial begins with Superman's origin on Krypton, he is sent to Earth as a child and raised by the Kents. As an adult, he adopts the persona of Clark Kent, a mild-mannered reporter at the Daily Planet. As with many serials of the time, each of the 15 chapters ends with an exciting cliffhanger, mixing action with suspense as Superman faces high-tech threats to Metropolis. Producing the serial came with several challenges, particularly in terms of budget. Actor Kirk Allen practiced flying scenes with wires, but the studio was unhappy with the results and opted for the animated approach. 
Rather than using expensive, practical effects seen in the flying sequences from the adventures of Captain Marvel in 1941, the production team resorted to animation to depict Superman in flight, a creative solution influenced by the earlier Fleischer Studios Superman cartoons. Since they were filming in black and white, Superman's costume design was made in shades of gray and brown to better show up on film. And like many serials, scenes were reused to save money. Despite being produced on a tight budget, the serial was a financial success, and its legacy remains strong, as it is considered one of the most successful serials of all time. The 1948 Superman serial is remembered today as a crucial piece of superhero and science fiction history. It played a key role in setting the stage for Superman's future on screen. Influencing later adaptations like the George Reeves' Adventures of Superman and the Christopher Reeve films. There are way too many future adaptations of The Man of Steel to mention, spanning television and film. I could probably make an entire video just on Superman adaptations. Both Kirk Allen and Noel Neal made cameo appearances as Lois Lane's parents in the 1978 Superman film. Though the scene was initially deleted for the theatrical release, it was restored in later versions. I'm not the biggest superhero fan, but this was an enjoyable, though repetitive story that set the stage for future adaptations. It was hampered by its low budget. Sure, the costumes are cheap, and the only interesting set design was on Krypton. My main complaint is the Spider Lady is a doll villain. Superman is available on DVD, and clips are available on YouTube. Full episodes are streaming on the Daily Motion website and the Internet Archive. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1948, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. Finally, a sci-fi film in color. The first since 1940's Dr. Cyclops. Unknown Island, though not the most well-known dinosaur film, is an important one to discuss. Directed by Jack Bernhard, it was filmed using the Cinecolor process that was distinct from the three-strip Technicolor method. It used two strips of film to create the final image, producing complementary colors, but struggled with accuracy in certain hues, particularly greens. Cinecolor was a cheaper alternative for budget-conscious productions, including those by the short-lived American studio Film Classics. The film was led by Virginia Gray as Carol Lane and Philip Reed as Ted Osborne. Richard Denning, who would go on to become a staple in science fiction films, like The Creature from the Black Lagoon, played John Fairbanks while Barton McLean took on the role as the volatile Captain Tarnowski, and everyone's favorite actor in an ape suit, Ray Corrigan, best known for his ape roles in Flash Gordon, put on the rubber dinosaur suit in this film. The screenplay was penned by Robert T. Shannon and Jack Harvey, and special effects by Ellis Berman contributed to the film's portrayal of the prehistoric monsters. The story follows Ted Osborne and his fiancée Carol Lane as they venture to a mysterious island rumored to be inhabited by dinosaurs. They're joined by John Fairbanks, a survivor of a previous expedition. Leading them is Captain Tarnowski. Together they face not only the island's deadly dinosaurs, but also rising tensions among the crew, especially as the captain's behavior becomes more erratic. Unknown Island was produced on a modest budget of $400,000 and grossed over $1 million at the box office. The film employed a combination of soundstage shooting for the actors and the dinosaur scenes were filmed on location in Palmdale, California. Rear projection techniques were used to create the illusion of actors and creatures sharing the same space with not-so-realistic results. While the special effects, including actors in rubber suits, may seem primitive now, they were notable for the era. One tragic note from the production is that an actor in a dinosaur suit reportedly died of heat exhaustion, with the footage of his fall right before his death making it into the final cut of the film. 
Upon its release, Unknown Island received mixed reviews. The New York Times criticized the film, describing it as, quote, a pretty flabby piece of fanciful movie making, and noted the sickly green dominance of the Cinecolor process. Footage was later repurposed for the American version of Godzilla Raids Again, titled Gigantus, the Fire Monster, released in 1959. The speculative biology of dinosaurs coexisting with humans is always fun to see on screen, even if the visual effects were not that great. It's not as marvelous as 1925's The Lost World and would be overshadowed by Godzilla and the creature features of the 1950s. It was good to finally see another color film, but the two-color process used did not do this average story any justice. Cinecolor was cheaper and flatter than Technicolor, and it shows in the final results. Unknown Island is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. El Sopa Sabio, or The Genius, is a Mexican comedy film with slight science fiction elements, showcasing the talents of the country's biggest film star, Cantinflas, who is probably best known outside of Mexico for his role in the 1956 film Around the World in 80 Days, directed by Miguel M. Delgado, who helmed 33 films featuring the Mexican superstar. This production blends humor with a touch of futuristic intrigue. It captures the spirit of the transformative era in Mexican cinema, known as the Mexican Miracle, a golden age during which the film industry experienced significant growth. At the center of the story is Cantinflas, who portrays an assistant to a renowned professor, who is played by Carlos Martinez Baina. Cuban actress Perla Aguiar is the charming reporter Marissa Miranda. Just before his passing, the professor was on the brink of discovering a revolutionary formula for a cheaper fuel called Carborex. The screenplay, originally drafted by French writers Jean-Bernard Luc and Alex Joffe, was finalized by Jamie Salvador, who had previously directed the 1946 Buster Keaton film Boom to the Moon. Famed Mexican painter Gunter Gerzo designed the sets contributing to the film's visual appeal despite a modest budget. Today, it is remembered as a fun entry in this Mexican superstar's extensive filmography. It highlights his ability to portray the common man caught in extraordinary circumstances. The film's themes of corporate greed and the power of scientific discovery reflect the societal changes and modernization occurring in Mexico at the time. There's some good cinematography in this film, that differs from many lower-budget American films that used only medium and wide shots. A colorized version is available on YouTube, and the original black-and-white version is on the Daily Motion website. Rocketeet, a Czech science fiction film, stands as a pioneering work in the genre particularly notable for its early depiction of nuclear anxiety and apocalyptic themes. Based on Karl Chopik's prescient 1922 novel, the film was produced during a difficult period in Czech history, between the end of Nazi occupation and the onset of communist rule in 1948. The film was helmed by prolific Czech director Otakar Vavra. He drew controversy during his career because of his willingness to work both under Nazi and communist regimes, but he would go on to mentor the future generations of Czech filmmakers. The film stars Karl Hoger as Prokop, the tormented scientist at the center of the story. Hoger, a prolific Czech actor, had nearly 100 film credits. Florence Marley, a French actress of Czech origin, plays Princess Wilhelmina, while Eduard Linkers, and Miroslav Homola round out the main cast. The screenplay was written by Vavra and his brother Yaroslav, adapting the original novel by Chapek, who is best known for coining the term robot in his influential play, R.U.R. Roslam's Universal Robots. The original novel focused on the idea of splitting the atom, while this deals with the power of destructive atomic weapons. After a lab accident, Prokop experiences strange hallucinations, realizing he may have given away his dangerous formula. 
As he navigates his feverish journey, the story mixes reality with dreamlike sequences, exploring themes of scientific responsibility, technology's potential for destruction, and the psychological scars of war. Krakatit's themes, inspired by the volcanic eruption of Krakatoa, highlights the catastrophic impact of unchecked scientific power. Prokop's hallucinations are reflective of the post-World War II period, anxieties surrounding nuclear weapons, and the ethical dilemmas faced by scientists. Bavar employed the expressionist visual style, combining elements of science fiction, film noir, and surrealism also bringing in German Expressionism to contribute to the film's unique and unsettling aesthetic. The film was produced during a period when science fiction outside Hollywood was already tackling serious themes, contrasting with American films of the time. But this film would not see an American release until 1951. Upon its release, the film received mixed reviews. While praised for its performances and visual style, some critics found the symbolism overwrought. The New York Times described it as, quote, a strident preachment for peace, but was a clouded and halting drama, unquote. Today, it's a largely unknown but significant work in the history of science fiction cinema, giving us a glance at what the coming Cold War could look like if it went hot, questioning if we learned anything after the war. The film is a hallucination drama until the last third, where the sci-fi elements finally kick in. The bomb itself isn't shown until the last few minutes. With a strong start and great cinematography, this was the standout film for me this year. Rocketeet is available on DVD and YouTube, and I recommend checking it out. Hormonit by Loinein, or Hormones Unleashed, is Finland's first science fiction film and a playful screwball comedy. Directed by Orvo Savrakivi and based on a novel by Armas J. Pula, it was a lighter comedic departure from the serious themes dominating post-war Finnish cinema. The film was produced during a pivotal period in Finnish history. In 1948, Finland was navigating a delicate political landscape in the aftermath of World War II. The country recently signed the Agreement of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance with the Soviet Union which significantly influenced its cultural and cinematic output. The director, who later expressed regret about making the film, brought in a group of notable Finnish stage and screen actors, including Ilka Halina, Joel Rini, and Reino Valkama. The story revolves around a stuck-up businessman in Helsinki. At a dinner reception, he hears about a new hormonal treatment that can revert a patient's mental state to that of a child. After receiving the injection, the group of friends begin to wreak havoc on the town with childish pranks and hijinks. As the story progresses, they find a new childlike wonder in the world and a zest for life that impacts their relationships. Produced by Finland's oldest and largest film studio at the time, it faced the challenges of many post-war productions. But the film showcased decent production values and a naive charm, but many critics found it lacking as a comedy. One Finnish paper criticized the film's chaotic nature, stating that, quote, brawling, shouting, gasping, painlessly leaping did not constitute good comedy, unquote. Another paper stated that, quote, only an audience member in the right mood and with very low expectations would have found it enjoyable, unquote. It's cute but not groundbreaking, and it's nice to see a serum used for fun and not for evil purposes, like in many American films at the time. Hormones Unleashed is available for free on the Finnish streaming service Elonet, which I'll link in the description below. Der Herr vom Andern Stern, or The Man from Another Star, is a unique blend of science fiction and comedy directed by Heinz Hilbert. The film offers a thoughtful, look at human nature through the perspective of an alien visitor, combining humor with deeper social commentary. In 1948, Germany was at a crossroads, dealing with the aftermath of World War II and the emerging tensions of the Cold War. Divided into occupation zones controlled by the Allied powers, this profoundly affected the film industry. Movie theaters began reopening as early as 1945, 
with each sector utilizing cinema for different purposes. In the Western-controlled zones, films served as tools for re-education, confronting the population with the horrors of the Nazi regime. Conversely, the Soviet sector employed films to promote its ideological agenda. The Man from Another Star features a noteworthy cast, led by Hans Ruhmann as the alien from another world. Ruhmann was a popular actor and comedian during the Nazi era, but he struggled to find work after the war. This role was part of rebuilding his post-war career. Annalisa Romir portrays Flora, the alien's love interest, while Hans Kosi makes his film debut as Emil, Flora's boyfriend. The screenplay was based on a short story by Werner Illing, who also adapted it alongside Max Christian Feiler. Illing, a veteran of both world wars, had previously written other utopian novels, including Utopolis in 1929. The film follows an alien who can travel through space using the power of concentration. When his focus is disrupted while passing Earth, he lands on our planet and is immediately faced with bureaucratic challenges due to his lack of identification. Navigating the complexities of human society, he uses his ability to manipulate and duplicate objects, drawing the attention of various groups, all eager to explore his powers. The Man from Another Star was filmed on location in Munich and showcased at the Venice Film Festival in 1948. Upon its release, the film received mixed reviews. While praised for its stylish filmmaking, critics found it slow-moving and preachy, and at times, incoherent. D. Zeit criticized the film for wasting its potential, stating that it devolved from a witty comedy into a, quote, bloodless instruction. By exploring the interaction between this advanced being and human society, the film wants to delve into classic science fiction themes of the cultural clash and technological superiority, offering a narrative that reflects the era's anxieties about progress and human nature. It's charming but a little preachy at times and very talky, but there are some decent visual effects even when they get repetitive. The Man from Another Star is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. And finally, one film I could not get a copy to review, but would like to discuss. Chemistry and Love is an East German comedy directed by Austrian filmmaker Arthur Maria Rebenalt. This Defa production marks the state-owned studio's first foray into the science fiction genre. This anti-capitalist satire set in the fictional country of Capitilia, the story follows Dr. Michael Olland, a brilliant chemist who invents a revolutionary process to transform grass directly into butter, bypassing the need for cows. This scientific breakthrough attracts the attention of various capitalists and their hired seductress, all wanting to acquire the potentially lucrative invention. As Dr. Allen navigates through a series of comical misadventures, he ultimately realizes that his true love lies with his assistant. Though Germany wouldn't officially be split into East and West until 1949, there were already separate film industries by this year. East German filmmaking was just beginning, but it was already starting to develop its own unique identity. The state-owned studio DEFA, founded in 1946, but film production was still slow, with only about 50 films made between 1948 and 1953 due to heavy government restrictions. Filmmaking in the region had quickly begun under Soviet supervision, as East Germany was still part of the Soviet occupation zone and carried strong ideological messages, often reflecting anti-capitalist themes. If you know where I can get a copy or stream this film, please let me know, and I'll add an addendum to this video. And all other films I've discussed today are linked in the description below if you would like to check them out. The anxieties of the atomic age were a prevalent theme in literature, reflecting concerns about nuclear war, mutation, and humanity's place in a rapidly changing technological world. This year saw the founding of Gnome Press 
specializing in science fiction and fantasy, the small publisher operating from 1948 to 1962 would release many future classics in its short time, like Isaac Asimov's iRobot and Foundation Trilogy, as well as works by Robert A. Heinlein, Robert E. Howard, Arthur C. Clarke, among many others. Many short stories from this year have since become science fiction staples. Ray Bradbury's Mars is Heaven, later retitled The Third Expedition, is a chilling tale of astronauts encountering deceased loved ones on Mars. The story was included in the Martian Chronicles, which was then later adapted into various media, including a 1980 TV miniseries and several radio shows like Dimension X and Escape in the 1950s. Wilmar H. Shiras's In Hiding introduced hyper-intelligent mutant children, This story laid the groundwork for her influential Children of the Atom series. While Judith Merrill's That Only a Mother explored a mother's love for her mutant child in a post-nuclear war setting. Frederick Brown's Knock, published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, is now famous for its opening line, The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock on the door, creating intrigue and many questions in just two sentences. Novels from 1948 also pushed the boundaries of the genre. Aldous Huxley's Ape in Essence depicted a dystopian post-nuclear world, while Arthur C. Clarke's Against the Fall of Night took readers to a future Earth in a seemingly stagnant utopia. This year, two future legends were born. William Gibson, born on March 17th, would go on to pioneer the cyberpunk subgenre with his novel Neuromancer. While Dan Simmons, born on April 4th, would gain fame for his Hyperion Canto series, blending science fiction with horror and history. This was another transformative year, with events that reshaped the world and continue to set the stage for the Cold War. History doesn't unfold in isolation. Culture, science, and the arts, especially science fiction films, all impact and are impacted by world events. Understanding the broader context of 1948 helps make sense of the science fiction of the late 1940s and beyond. So let's take a look at some of the key events from this year that left their mark on society and future science fiction. The world was shocked when Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated in New Delhi on January 30th. As a symbol of nonviolent resistance, his death underscored the difficulties faced by nations seeking independence and justice. On February 4th, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, gained independence from the United Kingdom, continuing the wave of decolonization across Asia and Africa. Later that month, on February 25th, communists seized power in Czechoslovakia, expanding Soviet influence and deepening the divide between East and West. In April, the Marshall Plan aimed to rebuild Europe's economy after the war, symbolizing hope and recovery. The creation of Israel on May 14th and the ensuing Arab-Israeli war sparked conflicts in the region. And Cold War tensions boiled over in June when the Soviet Union blockaded West Berlin on the 24th and the Western Allies responded with the Berlin Airlift beginning on the 26th. In July, President Truman reinstated the military draft amid Cold War tensions. And on July 26, Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the United States Armed Forces. On August 15, the division of Korea began, with the southern half proclaiming itself the Republic of Korea. And on September 9, the North followed, with renaming itself the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Harry Truman's surprise victory in the U.S. presidential election on November 2nd defied polls and predictions and gave us one of the most famous photographs in history. Nineteen forty-eight was a pivotal year for culture, setting the stage for trends that shaped American popular culture and subtly influenced science fiction cinema. Andrew Wyeth painted his iconic work, Christina's World which became one of the most recognizable American paintings of the 20th century. M.C. Escher's Drawing Hands, a lithograph of two hands sketching each other into existence, explored reality and illusion. Gordon Parks, a pioneering African-American photographer, produced several significant photographic series this year, including Harlem Gang Leader and Portraits of New York City Workers. 
The Riddler made his debut in Detective Comics number 140, bringing a new kind of challenge to Batman in the popular comic series. Meanwhile, in Italy, the Western comic series Tex launched and became a European favorite with its themes of frontier justice and moral ambiguity. Columbia Records revolutionized the music industry with the introduction of the 33 and one third RPM long playing record. Popular songs of the year included Dinah Shore's Buttons and Bows and Spike Jones' novelty holiday hit All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. Cole Porter's Kiss Me Kate debuted on Broadway, lending Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew with a modern backstage comedy. Two major novels were released in 1948. Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead was a raw portrayal of World War II, and Alan Patton's Cry the Beloved Country highlighted racial injustice in South Africa. Television continued to make strides this year, with ABC beginning its network operations, and we saw the launch of shows like Texaco Star Theater, The Ed Sullivan Show, and Candid Camera. The first Summer Olympics since 1936 were held this year in London, symbolizing a return to normalcy after the upheavals of the war. The legendary Babe Ruth passed away, marking the end of an era in baseball. And the popular board game Scrabble was first sold this year, though the game itself was created back in 1938. This was a game-changing year for science and technology, with breakthroughs in computing, physics, space exploration, and information technology. In computer science, major advancements in stored program computing began on June 21st with the Manchester Baby, the first electronic computer to run a stored program. And Claude E. Shannon published his groundbreaking work, A Mathematical Theory of Communication, coining the term BIT. On October 10th, the Soviet Union's test of an R-1 missile became the first missile to enter space, foreshadowing the space race that would captivate the world in the following decades. In astronomy, on February 16th, Gerard Kuiper discovered Miranda, the innermost of Uranus's large moons. On the theoretical side, physicists Alpha, Beta, and Gamow published their paper about the Big Bang Theory, greatly altering our understanding of the universe. On May 29th, Dutch physicist Heinrich Casimir predicted the Casimir effect, a phenomenon of quantum mechanics. The first monkey astronaut, Albert I, launched on June 18th from White Sands, New Mexico. Although the mission did not reach outer space, it marked an early step in the journey that would eventually lead to human spaceflight. The invention of holography by Hungarian-British physicist Dennis Gabor laid the groundwork for future developments in 3D imaging and holographic displays. Hollywood was undergoing massive changes that would reshape the film industry and culture as a whole. One of the most critical was the Supreme Court case, the United States versus Paramount Pictures Incorporated a landmark antitrust case which forced major studios to sell off their theater chains. This ruling marked the end of the studio system's dominance, paving the way for more independent productions, which allowed independent filmmakers and smaller theaters to have a better chance in the industry. Howard Hughes made headlines by purchasing RKO Studios for $8.8 million, signaling a shift in ownership dynamics within Hollywood. Warner Brothers made history by producing the first color motion picture newsreel, demonstrating the growing importance of color filmmaking. Sadly, this year also saw the passing of Sergei Eisenstein on February 11th, a monumental figure in cinema history, best known for Battleship Potemkin. His innovative editing techniques laid the groundwork for future filmmakers. The 21st Academy Awards were held on March 24th, 1949, and Hamlet became the first British film to win Best Picture and took home four awards, including Best Actor for Laurence Olivier. This timeless adaptation of Shakespeare's classic explored Prince Hamlet seeking revenge for his father's murder. John Huston won Best Director for The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and Jane Wyman won Best Actress for Johnny Belinda. A new category for Best Costume Design was introduced, highlighting the growing focus on the visual aesthetics in film, and both the cinematography and costume categories were split into color and black and white. Internationally, 
filmmakers outside of Hollywood delivered some iconic films that influenced global cinema. The Red Shoes, a visually striking ballet drama from Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, captivated audiences with its tale of a ballerina torn between her ambition and romance. The adaptation of Anna Karenina, also from the United Kingdom, brought Tolstoy's tragic love story to life, while Bicycle Thieves from Vittorio De Sica delivered a powerful portrayal of post-war poverty in Italy. In Hollywood, several key films made their mark. In the world of adventure, The Three Musketeers, starring Gene Kelly as D'Artagnan, brought swashbuckling action to the big screen. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, directed by John Huston, follows three prospectors, including Humphrey Bogart, on a journey for gold that quickly turns into a tale of greed and betrayal. Key Largo, also helmed by John Huston, delivered a tense thriller set in a Florida Keys hotel, where Humphrey Bogart faces off against a ruthless gangster during a hurricane. A Foreign Affair from Billy Wilder stars Marlena Dietrich and is a romance and political drama set in post-war Berlin. On the darker side, The Naked City delved into the gritty police investigation of a young model's murder. And finally, fans were treated to Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, a comedy where the iconic duo got tangled up with classic monsters like Dracula and Frankenstein's creature. From the rise of new political regimes to the exciting possibilities of space exploration, this year's sci-fi films reflected a world in transition. While Hollywood gave audiences the first live-action Superman and a colorful dinosaur adventure, other countries like Mexico, Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Finland contributed fresh, innovative stories that pushed the boundaries of the genre. Even Marvin the Martian's debut hinted at the growing fascination with space travel. Despite the challenges of the time, this year's film sparked imaginations and set the stage for a new era of science fiction. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content, and I'll see you in 1949.